Good morning, church. If you've ever met before, my name is Annette, and I'm part of the ministry team here at Hobart City Church. A very warm welcome to you for worshipping with us this Sunday morning. Here's a list of our guest speakers for the next three Sundays. Today, we have Ben Turley, the CEO of the Nepal International Nepal Fellowship, that, to share a message, and he'll also share about the work that is, the Lord has been doing through INF.
Last month, um, the Jewish people celebrated Passover. And we Christians celebrated Easter. Both of these events reveal that freedom isn't free. The cost of Israel's redemption from the slavery from the Egyptians was enormous. It cost the lives of Egypt's firstborn sons because Pharaoh would not free the slaves for anything less. Freedom from bondage comes at a cost. But so does the post-bondage life of freedom. After Passover, the Israelites no longer belonged to Pharaoh, but they were not free to live however they chose. They now belonged to God and were even obligated to trust him and to be obedient to him. Freedom is not free. Freedom and obligation go together. Jesus became our Passover lamb and by his blood and through his sacrifice, we were set free from the slavery of Satan and our bondage to sin. We read in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom, was, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. Now this is not an easy verse to live by, but we need to embrace it because it's only in living for God that we experience real freedom. The world tells us that we are free to choose our own paths and identity. But this results in slavery, in being controlled by our own opinions and desires which ends up in brokenness, bondage, and despair. But choosing God's way enables us to be the people God created us to be. We are both free and obligated to love and serve God and others. We are both free and obligated not to be bound by selfishness and sin, but to live joyful, fulfilling lives. We are not our own. We were bought at a price, a great price. The highest price that has ever been paid. Jesus, the Son of God, gave his life to buy our freedom. Therefore, let us honour God with our lives. Lord Jesus, how can we ever thank you for the freedom we have in you? It cost you everything, Lord. And I pray that as we share communion, that we will commune with you, Lord Jesus, this morning. Firstly, that we will listen to you to repent of any sins that we have committed. And secondly, with your help, we will choose to live lives that bring honour and glory to your wonderful name. Amen. I'm Ben. I work for International Nepal Fellowship. If you're in Australia, you probably say Nepal. If you're from Nepal, you probably say Nepal. It's fine either way. My uh, five-year-old niece, when we went to work in Nepal, uh, was seeing us off at the airport with my sister, and she said, can I go to the pool with them? And yeah, we didn't have the heart to tell her that. We weren't getting a plane to a pool. Um, the... 
look, let me get the intros to, about INF out of the way. International Nepal Fellowship is uh, a Christian organisation and movement in Nepal. Uh, it founded in 1952, so the first Nepali Christians and the first ex expat Christians who crossed into Nepal when the country opened up for the first time, having been a very closed, secretive uh, kingdom, um, travelled in. There were some nurses and doctors amongst them. They travelled up into the west of Nepal in Pokhara and founded the very first uh, specialised leprosy work. Leprosy is still a thing in Nepal, if you can believe it. Um, God willing, through the work and the prayers of God's people in a generation, it won't be. But at that time, they were working with some of the poorest, most marginalised, most stigmatised people. So the first leprosy program was born in 1952 in Pokhara. And the first church in Nepal was born through that group of people gathering together. Um, uh, Nepal is primarily a Hindu and Buddhist nation, but there's a, a strong, vibrant and growing Nepali church. So pray for, pray for everyone there, but pray for God's people there in particular. Uh, INF now runs three hospitals in the west of Nepal, working on leprosy, working on other diseases that affect people in poverty, working on spinal cord injury and other forms of disability to help give hope and healing, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual healing to people in really desperate times. And we work in community programs across the west of Nepal amongst poor and marginalised people, and that's um, one of those groups in the far west of Nepal, uh, people who live very, very close to the edge of survival. Um, and I'll share a bit more about some of those. I'm actually a Hobart boy. Uh, I was born here, uh, not very far from here, in fact. Uh, but we moved out of the state when I was 10 because my dad used to work at the newsprint mill and got work elsewhere. Um, I preach occasionally at uh, other people's churches. I'm a Church of Christ boy uh, as well, so it's kind of a little bit of a homecoming. I've never been to Hobart Church of Christ, but it kind of feels a little bit like a homecoming. I'm very familiar with Churches of Christ. Hobart feels still like my hometown, even though I haven't lived here for a while. Helps get me out of trouble being a Hobart boy. I was preaching at a Melbourne church uh, about a month ago. And one of the inter they interviewed me at the start to get to know me, and one of the interview questions was, which city is better, Melbourne or Sydney? And if you're a Sydney, if you're a preacher from Sydney, that's an obvious trap, right? You're in a Melbourne church, and they ask you which city is better, Melbourne or Sydney. But I had the easy way out, and I said, actually, I'm a Hobart boy, and you guys, you guys just don't understand. It's not even close. Hobart is better. Um, I genuinely believe that. Having lived in Sydney for a very long time, I still believe that. Um, I've also, so last bit of, last bit of random, uh, random info, I've put a couple of magazines and a, and a little flyer up the back. If you'd like to know more about INF, please do take one. I think it'll be good for you because there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. It'll certainly be good for me because it lowers my luggage uh, weight heading home. Um, and if you're not supporting uh, an international community development program, if you're not involved in sharing what you have generously with people around the world, and I bet most of you probably are, and I know your church is already involved in a bunch of stuff in the community, but if you are not, or if there's room in your life and your heart for sharing with another group, I think INF's excellent. Yes, I get paid to say that, but I genuinely believe it. And I do know for a fact that when God blesses us, it's not for us. It's not blessings for us to hold on to and squeeze every last drop out of for ourselves. When God blesses us, it's a blessing through us for others. When God blesses us abundantly, it's so that we can share abundantly in every good thing that God has for the world that God made and he loves. So that out of the way, I want to share a story from uh, the Bible I'm going to reflect just a little bit about on a really, really fundamental human need. So there's a few. You're aware of several of them. So food is a fundamental human need. Water, obviously. Shelter and protection against the elements. Um, portable shelter when it gets a bit chilly around the place. Obviously, really fundamental physical needs, right? But another fundamental human need is to be heard. And I will bet that the people who are most important to you, the people that you love the most and who you know love you the most deeply, are the people who hear you, who spend time to listen to you, to get to know you. I mean, we all remember people who have great stories to tell. We all remember people who are the life and soul of the party. But the people who we know love us 
are the people who spend the time to hear us, to get to know us. Being heard is a fundamental human need. And the stories that I'm going to share come to that and really focus on what happens when Christians take the time to hear those who have been silenced, those who feel ignored, those who feel like no one knows them and no one loves them and no one is looking out for them. What happens when Christians actually stand against that and take the time to listen? In the Bible, in Mark 10, uh, it's verses 46 to 52 if you want to look it up later. I'm going to give you my summary, but you know, do read it later so you can see the words uh, exactly as they're in Scripture. But in Mark 10, 46 to 52, Jesus has just left a city called Jericho. And on his way out of Jericho, there's a bit of a crowd following with him. And there's a, a man by the side of the road. He's a blind man and he's a beggar. And his name is Bartimaeus. And I already think that's quite interesting, that in Scripture we find this man's name. There were wealthier people in the crowd. There were more important people in the crowd, no doubt. But Scripture wants us to know this man, this marginalised, poor man who's been stuck by the side of the road begging, his name is Bartimaeus. There is not one single person made in the image of God that God does not know and love infinitely. And reminding us of the name of the beggar, the kind of person that you walk past and maybe turn away from if you're feeling a little embarrassed about the fact that you won't give, the scriptures say here is his name. This is this man. And Bartimaeus, as Jesus and the crowd are passing by, he shouts out. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And maybe that's just what a beggar says when they're asking for money. Have mercy on me. Show me kindness. Show me mercy. You know, I'm a beggar. Please give me some money. And he knows something about Jesus because he says, son of David. He's heard Jesus, the ancestor of our our King David. So surely if anyone's going to give me some money, Jesus will. It's not a bad begging strategy, I guess. But maybe there's more to it. Maybe he actually has heard something about Jesus being a healer. Maybe he is asking for something more. And in the story at this point, we don't know. All we know is that he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So this story starts with a voice, a voice being raised. Bartimaeus, by the side of the road, shouting out to be heard. And the story goes to another voice. Who speaks next in this story? It's the crowd. The crowd all turn to Bartimaeus and they say, shut up. And it's not, a, it's not a polite word in Greek. It's actually quite a strong word in Greek. It's not, oh, shh, quiet down, you know, oh, you were a bit loud. If you could just keep it down a little. It really is. They want to silence this man. Your now again, I'm just interpreting. It's not written in the scripture. But what is going on in their mind? What is going on in their heart? Why do they want so forcefully to silence a blind man, a begging man, a poor man who is speaking up? And anywhere in the world, in this community, in this country, in Nepal, anywhere in the world, you will find a dynamic where when somebody who's been marginalised, with someone who's been silenced where someone who's been sat by the side of the road for a long time tries to speak up, others, more powerful people, more privileged people, wealthier people, will try to silence them. I won't get too political, but it happens everywhere. That dynamic happens everywhere. And I believe that's part of what is happening here. Know your place. Stay in your place. Don't rock the boat. Don't speak up. Don't make noise. We don't want to hear you. He doesn't want to hear you. Shut up. And Bartimaeus won't shut up. He won't be silenced. He calls out again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And now Jesus speaks. Bartimaeus raises his voice. The the crowd raises their voice to try to shut him up. And finally, Jesus raises his voice. And I find this really interesting because who does Jesus talk to? 
At first, he doesn't talk to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is not the first person Jesus talks to. He looks at the crowd and he says, go and call him here. And again, I find this really remarkable. And as I was reflecting on this passage, I thought it's almost like there are two healings in this story. There's a a second one we'll get to. But actually, Jesus looks at the crowd and he is offering them a moment of healing right now. You have been trying to silence, the crowd has been trying to silence a poor man. They have been trying to continue to exclude and shove to the edge of the road a blind beggar. And Jesus offers them an opportunity to heal from that. Whatever attitude of exclusion, of superiority is in their hearts and in their minds, Jesus says, turn away from that. Repent from that. Do the opposite of that. Instead of excluding him, get him and bring him to the centre. Instead of silencing him, bring him closer so you can hear him. I think that's remarkable. Jesus is actually offering a healing to their hearts. And actually, uh, he has that offer for all of us all the time. Whenever we're tempted to exclude, whenever we're tempted to feel we're superior, whenever we're tempted to think, oh, they don't really matter, I don't need to hear them, Jesus is actually offering a moment of healing. And the crowd is healed for that moment in that one place at that one time. And they bring Bartimaeus into the centre and Jesus looks him in the eye and Jesus says to him, And again, I find this really remarkable. He says, what is it that you want me to do for you? The reason I find that remarkable is because I think we read this story and we all just basically assume we know, right? Here is a blind man who's begging by the side of the road. What is it that he wants? Oh, we know. He wants some money. He wants to be healed. We assume we know what Bartimaeus wants. But Jesus does not assume. Jesus pays Bartimaeus the honour and the dignity and the respect of saying for himself, what is it that he wants? What is in his heart? And Jesus says, I will be there with you. What is it that you want me to do for you? I wonder how many times people asked Bartimaeus, what is it that you want? And Bartimaeus says, teacher, I want to see. And you know how the story ends, of course. Jesus says, your faith has made you well, see. And he follows Jesus on the way. A physical healing, a healing of his identity, a healing of his sense of purpose. He follows Jesus as a disciple. So it's an amazing story of of healing. It's an amazing story of inclusion. And it starts with a voice being raised and it starts with a voice being heard, even though others were trying to silence it. Now, I think that has some implications for where Australia is at right now. I'll let you think about that uh, in your own time. But I want to share a story from Nepal uh, about a group of people who are some of the most marginalised people I've ever met. So if we could just bring up the, the particular photo... So this is a group of of women from the south of Nepal on the plains with India. Uh, They're from a Taru community. Tarus are an ethnic uh, indigenous minority in Nepal. And like a lot of indigenous ethnicities around the world, they are pretty poor and pretty marginalised. The mainstream has often pushed them to the edges, excluded them from mainstream education, required them to forget their language so they can learn in the dominant language, pushed a whole lot of things on them. And so they're they're already pretty marginalised based on their ethnicity. They are doubly marginalised because this entire community are what are known as uh, Kamaya, former bonded labourers, former slaves. So up until 12 years ago, it was legal to have effectively slaves in Nepal. So a Kamaya was a bonded labourer and they worked in the fields of a landlord or they worked in the household of a landlord. And so you did all the domestic work, you harvested the crops, you planted the crops, you weeded the fields, you made sure that everything was looked after. It's hard work, it's back-breaking work. And their payment was a place to live, enough but just enough food to eat, 
and once a year, an item of clothing that your landlord would give you. And if he was a generous person, maybe he bought it for you. And if he was less generous, he gave you a second-hand cast-off from someone in his family. Your entire life dictated by this landlord. If you get sick, can you go to the hospital or the clinic? If your landlord lets you go, you can go. Otherwise, no. If you want your children to go to school, can you send them to school? If your landlord lets you send your children to school, yes, they can. Otherwise, no. Every day is decided by what your landlord is prepared to let you do. And your labour is not yours. It's just for him and his family. And you eat only what he allows you to eat. And you wear only what he allows you to wear. For generations, six, uh, 12 years ago, that became... Oh, sorry, I think it was 18. Anyway, it's, within, it's well within my lifetime that this is a practice. It's well within that woman's lifetime. She was a slave. Her children were born in slavery. And that practice was abolished through a huge amount of work and campaigning across the country. It was finally abolished. And ex kamaya were given parcels of land so this community was given some land deep in the forest. So it's not great land, because you know, if it's great land, somebody else is using it. So they're given very marginal land deep in the forest. It's difficult to farm. But they have some land of their own for the first time. But not all of them, because again, to get the land, to have the government grant of land, your landlord had to write you a, a letter that said you were former Bonded labourers, former Kamaya, my slaves. And again, if your landlord was a decent person, he wrote that letter, you presented it along with other evidence, and the government gave you a grant of land. If your landlord wasn't a decent person or was ashamed to admit that he'd once owned slaves, he didn't write the letter. So half of that community, they don't have secure title to their land. And they live in fear that the Forestry Commission could come in any time find out that they don't have title to the land, bulldoze their homes and kick them out. So they're marginalised because of their, their, the land that they live on. They're marginalised because of their ethnicity. They're marginalised because of this history of oppression. And they're marginalised because of extreme poverty. So I, one of the ways I find I can gauge how poor a, a group is, often... Um, groups begin by collecting savings together. So women will meet monthly, they'll pool a few savings together, which they can then share when they need, you know, to buy something for the house or to purchase medicine if somebody gets sick. And that shared savings gives them access to something that they can't do themselves. And in some communities, they might save 100 rupees a month. And 100 rupees is about, I don't know, a buck 20. So it's not a lot of money. But that's all that some women can afford to put aside per month. This community were putting aside five rupees per month. That's all they could afford. Because their labour is collecting uh, firewood, flowers, uh, medicinal herbs from the forest, and selling them by the roadside. They're two hours' walk from the nearest town. They're two hours' walk from the highway. They're two hours' walk from the school where their kids go. They can't even do that walk for about two months of the year because during monsoon when it rains, the river rises so much that it floods around them and they're stuck in their community. Half their community don't live there for most of the year because they can't produce enough food for everyone to eat. So half the community, able-bodied people, are out working in factories or in mines or in hotels elsewhere. Uh, INF... Our partner in Nepal was the first organisation not only to work with this community, but to visit this community. So if you want to imagine a community that doesn't feel heard, this is a pretty good one. So if we could just move to the next uh, photo. Uh, this woman is Fulkamaya Kadawal, a uh, Fulkamari Kadawal and she is the chair of the self-help group that this community has formed. And when I was visiting, I was there with a couple of other people from Australia, and uh, one of them, we were asking them, how is, how is the project going? 
What were they planning to do? What were they hoping to do? And the project had only been going for a couple of months. And uh, early on, um, we'd seen some other groups raising goats and we'd seen some other groups um, planting vegetables to uh, improve the health and food production of their community, of their families. And so somebody asked, could you grow um, more vegetables here? Could you grow a wider range of crops to help improve health? And they said, well, we can't because the, the soil is so poor and we're not close enough to the river to irrigate, but we, we're thinking about ways that we might be able to improve that. And somebody said, could you raise goats? Because you can raise goats and you can sell them and the meat um, is reasonably valuable in the market and you could earn a bit more money that way. And they said, well, we can't raise goats. Because if we did, wild animals from the forest would come and attack the goats and everyone would be in danger. And I asked, what is the most significant thing that has happened for your community so far through this project? And do you know what Fulkamari said? She said... I, so this is probably going to make me cry. She said, I can speak to strangers. The most significant thing that has happened for her up until that point was she now feels able, confident and skilled enough to speak to a stranger. And I don't know how that sounds to you. In one way, it's such a tiny change, right? Right? But for a woman who was born into slavery, whose parents were born into slavery, whose every day was based on what her landlord was prepared to let her and her family do, to be able to speak up like Bartimaeus and say what it is she wants is profound. And it's the beginning of all the changes that will come to this community as they work together. And it happened because a group of Christians sat with them and didn't say, oh, we can see you've got terrible problems here and we're going to fix them. I know what you need. It's because a group of Christians sat with them and said, what is it that you want? And listened and heard and let them know that their voice mattered. And we worship a God, as we heard in that beautiful reflection before communion, we worship a God who hears the cries of his people. When they're, in, when they're enslaved in Egypt, God hears the cries of his people and he acts. And through his people, God still hears the cries of people who are oppressed and silenced and hurting, and he still acts. So can I invite you, whether it's through INF or through anyone, just to be people who are prepared to listen? Because it's when we listen that others know that we love. And it's when we listen that we hear God's call for us to respond to the voices we hear. Thank you.